Um, if you think within 30 minutes I can cover physical limits, sensitivity, specificity, and quantification of three imaging technologies, then you should leave the room. It will not be possible. But if uh, you don't expect that much, then you probably should stay because at least we're starting from the same uh, starting point. All right. So what I want to do is look at all existing imaging modalities that we have today clinically available and sort of plot them in terms of what's the modality and what information it provides. And there's very important discovery you probably can make right away, especially since you're attending this meeting, which is World Molecular Imaging Congress. Right, so if I look at this column, I will realize that there's only two imaging technologies that provide molecular information, PET and optics only. And therefore, the first question we probably should address is what's wrong with the other modalities or why they, as is, cannot provide molecular uh, information about image tissue, patient uh, samples, small animal, you name it. So just a quick reminder, I am part of this three-year educational plan, if you wish. Last year, in 2012, PET, SPEC, which is nuclear medicine, was covered, CT. This year, we're going to talk about optics, ultrasound, and combined technologies. And next year, there will be coverage of MRI. And because of this, I'm going to completely ignore MRI. I would assume you know nothing about it, and uh, me too. I will refer to PET, but I will ignore uh, SPECT and CT. And primarily, of course, we will focus on the topics we need to discuss. So I'm going to start with the energy concept, or at least to begin with, with the general diagram of modern medical imaging system. And you will discover that all of them I can describe with a one very similar diagram. Of course, you need a, a human being who will control the overall imaging protocol. We, of course, have a lot of electronics to control the imaging system, but more importantly is all of them uh, described by the same diagram will have two important pieces. Energy source that will transmit some form of energy into the human body or tissue sample, you name it. And then we have energy detector, right? So we're going to talk about energy for a few minutes. And the reason for that, not that it's topic of today uh, 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 concern, unless we're going to talk about Syria, and we're in there, but that's what most imaging modalities will have to consider if you want to understand their limits, physical limitations, and so on. So we have energy source, it has to interact with the tissue, then we detect it. A very simple, uh, uh, again, analogy or description, more or less intuitive, would be x-ray imaging where we take the patient, put it in between source and detector, transmit x-ray photons, they will interact with tissue, with tissue, we detect transmitted photons, and we form images. Most of you probably have been to dental office and have seen the x-ray images uh, collected there. So it's very simple, but it's based on this technology. Now, all imaging modalities will follow that, whether you look at ultrasound uh, or optics. Uh, uh, there will be some physical interaction between energy and the uh, tissue. There are some exceptions, such as thermography, which is using internal energy of the body, but they are not really uh, uh, the the uh, applications are very few of that. Now, one interesting discovery, PET does not follow that, or nuclear medicine. We take the energy source and we put it inside of the patient. Now, consequences of that are tremendous. Number one, it's fundamentally using contrast agent, or you might call it imaging probes or labels, to produce molecular and functional images within limited or low resolution uh, anatomical landmarks. And if you take the uh, uh, radio-labored pharmaceuticals, nuclear medicine does not exist. It just will not work. So that's actually one part of the mystery. The reason PET and SPEC can provide molecular information is because they use contrast agents. Now, what about optical imaging? Well, in optical imaging, the situation is slightly different or drastically different because the light, by definition, interacts with tissue at molecular level. So by default, you should be able to get uh, molecular images. And there is also rich endogenous molecular contrast between different types of tissues. What I'm showing here is two states of hemoglobin, oxygenated and deoxygenated also fat and water, and you can see as a function of wavelengths, their optical properties changes drastically. So that's what we will be using to obtain optical images of tissue or specifically chromophores that exist within the tissue. Now, the second point is uh, both contrast and penetration depths are determined by this interaction. 
and interaction will lead to uh, energy removal, which will affect uh, uh, the penetration depths and resolution and overall image quality, if you wish. Now, in this range, we really don't have uh, much hope because everything absorbs so badly that we will, uh, the energy will be removed before it's detected. And probably on that end, it's the similar story because water will absorb too much of the energy. So here's your optical window within which you can actually perform optical imaging. And another way of showing that, this is what I'm plotting here, is on top of histology slide, and this is just the scale for you of 70 microns. If you use violet, then it barely penetrates into the tissue. You can see sub-millimeter penetration. If you use visible light, the penetration is slightly deeper. Then the preferred, perhaps, wavelengths range would be near infrared, where penetration is drastically deeper and can reach several centimeters in tissue. And then once you exceed that range again the water absorption will dominate and you will not transmit much energy inside of the inside of the tissue right so now in terms of optical technologies what do we have we have optical microscopies uh, and I kind of bulge several approaches under this uh, particular umbrella and then we have tomography right which is an optical coherence tomography bioluminescence fluorescence and overall i would name it diffuse optical tomography and there's a significant difference between those but one thing that is common that nearly all of them would or can utilize contrast agents to make better images with improved sensitivity and specificity and this is probably the only place i'm referring to sensitivity and specificity because really to quantify that you need to sort of appreciate what imaging systems you use, what energy you're dealing with, what contrast agent you have accessible or available to you, and then you will be able to derive that information. Anyway, let's go with the confocal microscopy, which is uh, uh, pictorially shown here. You have a laser source through the pinhole in this uh, uh, mirror. It illuminates the sample underneath. And what's cool about this technology is in the detection part, we have the lens, again, pinhole in the detector. And if you follow sort of these red lines versus uh, uh, green and yellow lines, you would realize that uh, everything except from this particular point or, or plane in space, every light is rejected except uh, which is coming from that plate. So by definition, this imaging system will allow you to maintain the focus at a particular focal plane. And then by mechanical scanning, you can actually dissect the tissue and image it. Uh, so that's a fantastic technology. It has very, very high spatial resolution. The penetration depth is uh, unfortunately limited. It's typically on the 100 to 200 micron range, and it's limited by mean free pass propagation of a photon, which means the pass until the photon will encounter a scattering event. So as we know, tissues are extremely scattering. Uh, generally speaking. Now, in terms of contrast or contrast agents, you probably don't need much here because absorption and fluorescence would be your contrast mechanism, and that is indeed very rich in terms of tissue. So you would scan it as a function of wavelengths, and you should be able to make fantastic images, and typically we don't employ contrast agents. But the contrast is based on absorption and fluorescence. So stunning quality images one could obtain, none of them using necessarily contrast. It's all just uh, tr uh, tricks in, in uh, uh, optical technology development. So fantastic images, but the problem with them is you're only imaging about 200 microns. So if you're looking at a small animal imaging or, or even human patient, then of course that's not the technology you would use. Now, two-photon microscopy is extension of confocal microscopy, as far as I can tell, and I don't do much of the optics. So in a single photon excitation, we transmit the light, the light will be emitted back, and that's what we detect. In two-photon excitation, we need two photons in exchange to one emitted photon. And what it means is that two photons are required, and they only will be achieved at the focal uh, zone of the uh, laser beam. No out-of-focus excitation will be possible because this is, a, relatively speaking, nonlinear effect. So no pinhole is required because my focusing is now done through excitation, not through much to the, through detection mechanism. And another good quality of that, we will be able to use longer wavelengths uh, to excite the tissue, which means we're going to penetrate deeper into the tissue. Right. So because of that, we typically will extend the penetration depth by a factor of three to five, if you wish. The spatial resolution should not change, but it might change 
if you're imaging deeper, optics, still optics. Contrast is based on absorption and fluorescent. And here, again, to, in order to extend the uh, penetration depths, we might end up using contrast agents, which will come to us in forms of dyes. and could be molecularly targeted dyes and, of course, nanoparticles that also could be targeted. So now you can appreciate sort of the quality and uh, uh, differences of those images obtained by two-photon microscopy versus images I showed you before. We actually were able to visualize deeper and broader extent of the tissue. We're looking at different uh, physiological and molecular events. And, but generally, again, this would be limited to microscopic approaches where the penetration this is on the order of sub-millimeter. Uh, and then bioluminescence, uh, fluorescence, uh, those are two different approaches, but I merged them together because they based on, uh, again, light uh, produced inside of the tissue, either through enzymatic reaction or in fluorescence as in response to the external light. So those are the two diagrams shown here. And unfortunately, I copied the wrong file, so I'm missing references. None of the images I showed you before are my images, so I should have referenced them. Uh, but in case of bioluminescence, we uh, introduce the enzyme, and then it responds as, uh, with production of light that we detect outside. This is the uh, picture of the enzyme. In case of fluorescence, there is excitation light, and then there is emission light. And one of uh, uh, common species we will be using uh, possibly could be green fluorescent protein. So again, in terms of sort of image uh, parameters or limitations, penetration depth is now limited by, uh, its penetration depth is much, much bigger. It could reach actually many, many centimeters, typically within uh, 10 centimeters. And it's determined by sort of not necessarily ballistic, but, but uh, uh, other transport of the photons into the tissue, they will some, uh, somewhat scatter. Because of the scattering associated with the delivery of light, the spatial resolution will be drastically sacrificed. You're now talking on the order of one to three millimeters versus microns in previous case. In contrast versus contrast agents, in one case it will be enzyme, in the other case it will be endogenous or exogenous contrast, which comes either in form of uh, e existing chromophores, fluorescent proteins, hemoglobin, collagen would be examples, or in, tr in form of fluorescent dyes or nanoparticles that uh, contain fluorescent dye. In terms of images, now you're talking about much deeper scale, uh, lower resolution, but penetration depths uh, uh, increased. And this is sort of diffuse optical tomography, not to be specific though here. Uh, uh, and, and again, you can see the sort of animal uh, uh, silhouette and you can see the hot spots that correspond to particular molecule present that you're looking for. Okay, if I summarize optical imaging uh, in this very simple slide where I'm plotting resolution versus penetration, confocal microscopy will have very high uh, resolution, but unfortunately limited penetration. Two photon uh, or multiple photon microscopy will extend that range a little bit, but truly diffuse optical tomography approaches will extend it drastically. And we typically don't use them for high resolution, but we use them for visualizing much deeper and, and larger structures. In terms of sensitivity, all of them will be on the order of nano molar concentration of the contrast agent. The microscopy technologies will be a little bit better, but diffuse optical tomography technologies will still be on par with nanomolar concentrations. And therefore, to uh, kind of summarize optical imaging, we have a variety of approaches. There is a significant trade-off between resolution uh, and penetration. Um, determined by the physics and light and tissue interaction. These technologies are highly sensitive because they provide uh, sufficient contrast with small presence of the uh, uh, molecule we might be looking for. And the beauty is endogenous contrast by itself is fantastic, but we have access to a lot of uh, exogenous uh, contrast agents as well. So uh, both of them will be either collagen, hemoglobin, you name it, green fluorescent proteins, dyes, and nanoparticles to be specific. I'm going to switch gears and talk about ultrasound. The diagram will be nearly the same, except, which is not critical, we're going to combine energy source and detector. That's uh, shown right here. So this particular uh, imaging scan head will transmit 
acoustic wave into tissue and will detect it uh, uh, subsequently. So what we do is we now switch from electromagnetic energy to pressure or acoustic waves. That's what we're going to transmit into the tissue. We will be receiving backscattered ultrasonic signal and because it's backscattered, it will depend on mechanical inhomogeneities in the tissue, specifically how dense are the tissues. Because there will be variations of the, of the density and speed of sound, and that's what will cause backscattered signal to come at you. We'll receive this signal using the same ultrasound transducer acting in the receiver mode and form the image. So this is one of the typical images shown here where you see a couple of image qualities. Number one, the contrast is not fantastic. I mean, I, I mean, this is soft tissues all together bulged into one and look darker, maybe brighter, but overall contrast is something we would like to improve and we could do that with introduction of contrast agents. But what's good about this image is penetration, very decent resolution uh, at the same time. So showing here the lymph node in the mouse, you can see it's a, uh, uh, on the order of millimeter structure, you can see the skin, of course, and the uh, outside and inside tissues of the mouse. So ultrasound is highly scalable technology. If you change the frequency, that wavelengths will change at the same time, and you can go from typical medical ultrasound imaging to ultrasound biomicroscopy, where you can visualize structures on the order of uh, uh, tens of microns, versus you can do acoustic microscopy, where you can do a, actually at the even sub-micron level, but those samples usually need to be fixed so that you're not dealing with in vivo samples. The other good quality of ultrasound, and that actually compares with nuclear medicine, if we change the frequency and turn the intensity slightly on, we can actually achieve ultrasound therapy. Same as the nuclear medicine approaches where we uh, uh, could visualize something inside but also can treat the patient. Now, the problem with ultrasound, it does fantastic morphological imaging. It can do functional imaging using Doppler ultrasound elasticity. There are various approaches we're developing. But it does suffer in terms of cellular and molecular imaging, and primarily because typical contrast agent for ultrasound will be on the order of microns. So it's no longer we're talking about nanometer, which is the language of biology. We're looking at micron size contrast agents, and typically those would be limited to vascular compartments within the body. You really cannot extravasate them into the tissue. So we're limited to those targets. Now, bubbles, what we typically use in ultrasound, are fantastic contrast agents because A, they are about the right size, micron uh, size diameter, so I can see a lot of backscattered echo from them, such as shown in diagram A and B. But the other good part about micro bubbles is they resonate and happen to be resonating at exactly the frequency we still can detect with the same ultrasound system. And so we have two forms of contrast. One comes from the backscattering of the sound and one comes from the bubbles playing music to you. And if you can listen to that, then you will make even crispier and uh, higher contrast uh, images. In terms of sort of making cellular molecular imaging, what we do is we, of course, have to start with the target. What are we trying to image? Clots, tumors, lymph nodes, and so on. Again, remember, it will be in the vascular or otherwise some uh, big compartments. In terms of ligands, we have several approaches. Could be drugs, could be proteins, uh, uh, antibodies. And then we have to conjugate that and attach it to the surface of the bubble. And typically, biotin or similar approaches would be used. Right, so a couple examples. Now I do have actually references here. Uh, uh, this one is visualizing breast cancer in the uh, animal model. And you can see those are VGFR uh, targeted uh, contrast microbubbles. So they stick to the vasculature within the tumor. And by visualizing that, you will be able to tell uh, uh, something or tell uh, about angiogenesis. And the second example actually comes from review paper of the chair of this session is where two contrast agents were injected, unspecific microbubble, so not targeted if you wish, and RGD targeted, and you can clearly see the difference between the two images. So targeting does improve specificity and so on. But again, specificity will depend on many other parameters. What's your injection dose? What's the acoustic power you're using? What's your sensitivity of the imaging device? So it's not necessarily a simple topic to parse uh, and, and sort of predict what you will uh, perhaps be able to deal with in the real practice. Now, 
Still, we have not solved the problem of microbubbles being large. That's a big, big challenge in ultrasound. Yet, there are solutions. So, I stole this diagram from uh, another paper, which nicely sort of lists the size of the microbubble, but others also some other contrast agents we possibly can use. Right, so as shown in this diagram, microbubbles, targeted or not, will remain in the vasculature of the system in vascular compartments. Yet other constructs, and you can appreciate they now on the order of nanometer, all the liposomes can be made large, they should be able to escape, especially through the leaky vasculature of the tumor. And that's what we would like to use. Right, so first of all, you can just take simple nanoparticles, and in this case, it's perfluorocarbon based emulsion of nanoparticles, inject it into the animal or patient, and if they accumulate in sufficient quantity, uh, basically they will tattoo your organ, and ultrasound contrast by definition will increase. But this is not necessarily a widely applicable approach because you're not only, again, looking at vascular targets and injuries, you would like to image tumors and image uh, extracellular markers together with intracellular. So here's the new concept in ultrasound imaging. So this is the old concept. You have bubbles, they will stick to the vasculature or to the markers uh, uh, overexpressed in the vasculature. And then using typical ultrasound energy, you will be able to interrogate them and form the images. But now here's the trick. What if I take this contrast agent, which consists of perfluorocarbon, and condense it before I inject it? What will happen is, because of the Laplace pressure increase as a function of size, that perfluorocarbon will not be able to convert phase transition back into gas unless I provide additional excitation. And so instead of injecting this contrast agents into the body, we would like to inject something that is much smaller, yet not necessarily contrast agent for ultrasound to begin with. Once we inject something like this, we should be able to deliver either temperature or acoustic energy to the size, to the site of the uh, uh, tissue and cause vaporization of those droplets such that they convert into gaseous state and then become contrast agents for ultrasound. So I think this is a very cool sort of approach or concept in ultrasound imaging. I was able to solve problem of delivery of the contrast agent because it's small, yet I'm still utilizing known to me ultrasound contrast, so I got the best of both worlds, if you wish. So here's how this technology would work. This came from Paul Dayton's paper, review paper. I can inject those perfluorocarbon droplets. I can vaporize them as they sort of uh, passing the uh, uh, imaging site. They will form bubbles, and those bubbles I should be able to see. Uh, using my typical ultrasound system, or if I wait longer, those perfluorocarbon droplets will be able to extravasate through leaky vasculature into the tumor. They, then I apply my high maybe intensity or medium intensity ultrasound to cause phase conversion and visualize the microbubbles now within the tumor but outside of the vasculature. And uh, the same group of researchers actually demonstrated that using uh, a targeted uh, nanoparticles in cancer cells, where this is before vaporization, you can see the images don't have much contrast, whether they target it or not. And after vaporization, because of targeting, they were stuck here, so we convert them to bubbles. Thus, there is a huge contrast increase, versus here, there's pretty much no difference between before and after. Right, so you do the targeting to achieve the uh, uh, retention, and then you vaporize those nano droplets to visualize them as they present in the tissue. So now I'm going to put ultrasound on top of the optical imaging. And what's good about ultrasound, it doesn't go all the way here because we need to fix tissue. But what it does, it extends sort of or, or allows you to image at much higher resolution or significantly higher resolution while maintaining the same, the same depths, if you wish. I have no idea how much time I have. Another half an hour? Okay. I'm going to talk about a combination of ultrasound and optics, right? So what I've been uh, hoping to tell you before is that ultrasound is fantastic technology. It's real time, can visualize an anatomy structure, deep penetration, and good spatial resolution. But it's absolutely not sensitive to molecular events, even cellular, right? Unless you introduce contrast and unless that contrast is actually significantly small. Light is completely opposite. It has pros and cons, but if I consider those pros and cons, I will find that they kind of counteract each other.
good penetration, bad penetration, not sensitive to molecular cellular events, and optics by definition is. So what if I take those two modalities and combine them, will I be able to solve all the problems in the world? And, and that technology actually fortunately does exist. It's called photoacoustics or combination of light and sound. The way I refer to it is the ideal union of uh, deaf and blind, if you wish. Because what happened with this union is every negative or, or limitations of which technology is removed because they substitute it with the uh, pros of the uh, other complementary technology. So the, what makes me really happy is that those systems do exist now on the market. This is one where truly ultrasound and photoacoustics is combined. You can see that here, that's the ultrasound system, added laser, and then laser and light will coexist at the tip of the imaging probe. But even more exciting, it's not the only one company, there are actually two more companies that produce photoacoustic imaging systems. And I think some of them, if not all of them, will be present at this conference. So that's exciting. So it's no longer my fantasy or fantasy of researchers, it's actually becoming a commercial reality, which means you can use it in clinic. What it can do is it can visualize the same optical contrast because if I excite tissue at, let's say, this wavelength where hemoglobin is absorbing but not drastically, my contrast in my images will be uh, related to hemoglobin concentration. If I introduce second wavelengths, I should be able to produce two measurements I have two unknowns uh, in order to determine oxygen saturation, and I will be able to visualize that. And so here are a couple images from uh, uh, visual sonics. You can see the microvasculature. You can see oxygen saturation within the tumor. Another example by Andra. Uh, this is a vis a visualization of vascular heterogeneity in response to therapy. Uh, in this case, I will not talk too much about those images, you can talk to the manufacturers. And images from ITERA where they look at the tumor hypoxia, very important indication of uh, tumor progression or malignancy or uh, therapy and treatment monitoring, right? But the other very exciting part is we can take existing ultrasound, combine it with photoacoustic, introduce contrast agents, and then we should be able to image everything starting with anatomy all the way to function and molecular information. And as we do so, we should be able to detect the disease, we should be able to characterize, diagnose the disease, treat it or image guided, uh, uh, provide image guided treatment and then monitor the outcome of the therapy. That's the hope. So a couple of quick examples. In terms of contrast agents, it happened to be, this is the trick of mother nature. We can use nano constructs and they are fantastic optical absorbers, which means they are fantastic photoacoustic contrast agents. In comparison with dye, which we also can use, nanoparticles, plasmonic especially, happen to be a little bit better because their significant efficiency compared to dyes. They are five, six, or four, five, three orders of magnitude more efficient than dyes and significantly more efficient than the tissue. They fortunately exist at the nanometer scale, and so we should be able to make this molecular, highly specific images, but at reasonable depths and high resolution. So there are plenty of contrast agents we can use, but the two examples I will give you, maybe, is that the indication that my time is up? No. Um, so one example is we're looking at the sentinel lymph node. Sentinel lymph node is the first node where the tumor uh, uh, drained the cancer cells before they metastasize to distant organs in the tissue. So if we want to visualize it using photoacoustics, we can actually pick this particular MMP sense dye, which changes optical absorption be, uh, in the presence of MMP this particular matrix, right? So if we inject that dye into animal model, which has primary tumor and metastasis in the lymph node, we should be able to visualize the functional behavior of the dye and therefore what are we dealing in terms of micrometastasis in the tissue. And this supposed to be movie, it probably wouldn't play. This is ultrasound image of the tissue with the lymph node segmented. We're looking at the top, front and side view. And what's shown in yellow, it's not the super high resolution because it's just the preliminary study, but yellow indicate the presence of the MMP, which in turn relates to the presence of the micrometastatic cluster of cancer cells in this case. Ah, it does play. <laughs>
So it's before injection or immediately after injection. You can see how the dye would penetrate, will, will be delivered or drain into the lymph node and then uh, change the color because it's interacting with the cancer cells. So that's, in my opinion, a smart dye. It changes the optical property. It does indicate what's truly happening in the tissue. Okay, different example. I'm going to go back to the same nano droplets made out of perfluorocarbon. What we've done is introduce some optical contrast agent inside of that, either in form of dye or plasmonic nanoparticles, nano rods, such as shown here. And what will happen with this particular nano construct, if you irradiate it now, not with the ultrasound of high intensity, but with the laser pulse, it will convert itself into the uh, bubble. Now, as it does convert itself into the bubble, it will produce humongous photoacoustic response, which is the movie I'm playing here, showing the image before irradiation, and then right after the laser pulse. We're pulsing laser continuously, but only in response to the first pulse, when the contrast agent is there, it producing uh, photoacoustic response. Before, there is no ultrasound signature because it's a clear liquid. We cannot really visualize nanoconstructs. But once we vaporize optically those nano droplets, we actually have bubbles that will produce photoacoustic contrast. So what I'm showing you here is two contrast agents in one body. One of them is photoacoustic, the other one is ultrasound, but they coexist at the same time. I did not put photoacoustics on top of this because it will cover this entire diagram because it does really take best out of those two and so it can coexist anywhere along this diagonal on this diagram. I will conclude with this text slide and I apologize for uh, extending my time, but optical ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging can do anything you want. You just need to appreciate what they're capable of doing and uh, uh, what you're particularly interested in. But it's non-invasive, non-ionizing, real time, could be multiplex. I can use various contrast agents, multimodal. We have a variety of contrast agents. It's portable and cost effective. In terms of contrast agents, there are smart or activatable contrast agents. They biocompatible, non-toxic, and therefore clinically relevant, which is really exciting because all of those optics already in the clinic, but it's in the form of microscopy. But I now can take ultrasound and photoacoustics, move it to clinical establishment and be actually relevant imaging modality that can do more than just anatomical imaging. Now, the bad uh, uh, news is I really cannot tell you much more about any of those because the choice of what modality and what subset of sort of uh, approach you would use highly depends on the clinical or your practical applica application. And I'd like to leave with the acknowledgement of people who've done this work. Uh, and of course, all of you sitting in the audience or people that published paper that I scavenged and forgot to reference. Uh, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.